goes a little further, I guess. Uh, you know, you, you, if, and a lot of it has to do with desensitizing, uh, you know, desensitizing people to real life uh, consequences for their actions, uh, which just plays a role too. Um, but just uh, just last night, uh, we had a uh, uh, an individual terrorizing a community that was was going around doing Facebook Live uh, of his uh, of his cornage. Uh, so so it we were kind of entering a new a whole new era here where technology is changing at such a pace that uh, that it's it's enabling and and in a lot of ways encouraging and and glor- you know glorifying uh, this this very violence. Are there? Some of the media companies that uh, social media platforms, I mean, it, it seems to me that they have a, a strong social responsibility uh, for their content as well. What are some of the challenges we have with uh, with the present media companies and maybe some examples of of uh, of how these challenges have really hampered our ability to do it? You know, uh, technology is constantly evolving uh, and, and our approach to it has to constantly evolve as well. We're always a step behind. You know, that's a really good point. I mean, there's a number of challenges. Challenge one is a lot of the laws that law enforcement depends on um, for access to information uh, communications, those laws were written, you know, when we were still relying on analog communication technologies, right? And, and the, the drafters of the, that legislation, you know, probably didn't even anticipate um, the types of technologies uh, that were would be that are in play today. And as you pointed out, the laws are not flexible enough at times to take into account how rapidly technology evolves. So that's that's one challenge. Second challenge is that, you know, I think we we oversimplify at times how criminal organizations uh, and even those who are engaged in in targeted attacks or mass casualty attacks or gang violence are using social media. And sometimes in some cases, uh, these communication capabilities Will, will will be used to for an individual to articulate their intent to engage in violence. In other cases, um, content is being placed there by groups or individuals, foreign and domestic, who want to influence uh, those who are in our those in our society who are vulnerable to um, or who are looking for the justification to go out and engage in a target attack. In other cases, uh, we see uh, these platforms being used. Uh, as a way for uh, a gang member or someone else to bring visibility into their act of violence. Uh, and they will often post photographs or videos or even live stream um, their illegal activity or violent activity. Um, and there's important evidence um, and information that can be used um, to, to respond to an attack that may be only available by looking at uh, the social media uh, activity. Uh, and then finally, it's the way people are reporting crime these days. You know, increasingly we're seeing people not pick up the phone and call 911 when they're witnessing a crime, but they'll video it and post it. Uh, and there are cases where the first uh, notice to a law enforcement agency that a crime was in progress, uh, a very serious and violent crime, uh, was that they picked up the social media posting. So we really need to think more broadly from a law enforcement perspective, how we are going to look at the information that's available through these platforms. As far as the platforms, you know, I think there's a lot more that they can be doing, but I also think uh, that uh, they're not the answer to the problem necessarily alone. Uh, there, there's a lot of work they can do f- from a perspective of deplatforming people or redirecting people or evaluating the, the advanced computing algorithms they use to funnel people to content um, th- that may, you know, as we have seen with the rise of the Boogaloo movement and, and, and other extremist organizations, may actually drive people to um, extremist ideological belief systems. So they can do more policing their own, no pun intended, but policing their own platforms. Um, where I think the greatest value will come, though, is improve, opening the aperture for law enforcement, again, I mean, doing it in a way and doing it in a way, of course, that's protective of privacy and civil liberties, but opening the aperture for law enforcement to be able to evaluate as part of their violence prevention activities uh, or investigative activities, the content that's being placed online. And I think that's where we still have a lot to go, a far, a long way to go, excuse me. Um, One, we need to open the aperture, again, with very specific rules and, and protocols that protect privacy and civil liberties. But we, the law enforcement needs access to 
those activities that are taking place online. And law enforcement also has to understand how it fits into um, the prevention investigative work. And, and I think that's still a gap as well. Um, you know, understanding how, you know, a, a, a media operation associated with Al Qaeda or the Islamic State is using content to to inspire and inform tactically uh, lone offender attacks in the U.S. is important, and it's important for a patrol officer to understand that because they may be responding to a call for service, they may be involved in self-initiated activity, they may be making observations in their community, and without that knowledge and understanding, it's going to be difficult for them to place those observations or that information they receive into context. So we have a long way to go with the, the companies, um, but we also have a long way within our profession, a long way to go within our profession, uh, incorporating the wealth of knowledge that's available through the analysis of online activity into our violence prevention and investigatory practices. You know, there's a uh, look. We could we could talk for probably a couple of hours here because there are actually uh, feeds, there are social media platforms that are are clearly the the, the entire intent. Is to uh, is to, to to disrupt in in, in a violent nature. I mean, I'd simply look at the uh, supermarket shooting in New York and the uh, the postings that were done and in, 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 you know in a platform that that really encouraged that type of activity. Um, there is there is a, a whole different world out there that a lot of the public doesn't understand, but they are building a community around themselves of uh, justifying their their violent actions. So, um, any thoughts on that? On those platforms? Yeah, no, I mean, I think I think you raise a really intriguing point. I mean, if you look at the larger platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Google, um, they, they've done a lot of work um, um, to, uh, as I as I mentioned earlier, to to understand what's going on within their environments uh, and to address security related issues. But again, even with those companies that have been most cooperative, we have to understand that you know they have a revenue generation model. They have a business model that depends on people staying on their platforms for long periods of time so they can sell advertising uh, or collect data from those people. So they're always you know, going to be balancing the need to keep people and keep content on their platforms with the, the good citizen responsibilities of, of working with law enforcement and others to um, remove harmful content. The other issue that I think makes this challenging is there's a lot of concern about these platforms playing the role of being the arbiters of free speech. Um, yes, they have authority because they are privately run companies to decide who's on their platform or not. But we've already had a lot of discussion in our country about those who feel they're being excluded from these platforms simply because they hold views that may not be popular uh, or uh, may be um, um, you know, may others may find repugnant, but still be protected by constitutional protection. So, so that's part of the challenge. But putting those platforms aside, we have you know growing uh, you know on a day to day basis other types of platforms uh, and and private online communities where there's a lot of um, a lot of conversation taking place uh, that has a direct relationship with. Um, with the violence we're seeing in, in communities. I mean, look, when I was a police officer working in, in, in Southern California, when one gang member wanted to threaten a gang member from another part of the city, they would spray paint their name, their moniker on the wall. They would cross it out. They put the numbers 187, which is the California penal code for section for homicide. And that was their way of threatening somebody. Today, gang members and gangs, street gangs have Facebook pages or other social media presence. And they use that platform to challenge other gangs, to threaten other gangs, to, to project their strength uh, and their street cred. And it creates potentially cycles of violence where you will have a threat, you'll have an act of violence, you'll have a posting regarding that act of violence, it'll be consumed by the, those targeted it will result in a responsive act of violence. And, and it's been described to me by folks in Chicago and, and other cities that are seeing this as almost like a spasm of violence. And quite frankly, it's very difficult to work with all those different platforms, those, those, those smaller platforms, um, because one, they don't necessarily have the resources to deal with these issues or they don't have the inclination. So it's a really, really, really complicated issue. 